Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar. I think we just uh, wait another like half a minute to give everyone the chance to log in. And then we will start with an introduction by Martin Peacock from Simmer and Peacock. So just a few more seconds. So uh, I'm just talking so you all guys can, you can hear that your audio works properly. <laughs> and um, Yes, so I think, uh, please, uh, Martin, just uh, take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lutz. Well, welcome everyone to the first um, webinar from um, ZP and FarmSense. Uh, FarmSense, I think FarmSense is a better name, uh, PalmSense, but uh, <laughs> now welcome. So this has been a long time coming. I've been um, watching and aware of PalmSense for over a decade now, and I would almost say 15 years, getting close to. I saw the first sort of handheld potential stats from PalmSense a uh, long time ago. I was living in California at the time, and I thought, ah, this is perfect. So I'm really delighted now to be finally teaming up with the guys to do um, a webinar. So, you know, over the years, when you look at, um, let's say, the PalmSense potential stats, they got smaller and smaller. And now obviously they've been cutting edge again and now they've brought it down to connect straight to um, the Android phone. So they've really, you know, if I see another LinkedIn post where somebody's showing the testing on a um, on an Android and it's a um, it's a sense it potential stat, I think the investment community is all going crazy thinking this is great, but us who are all in the know, we know what's going on here. They're all just buying sense it potential stats. Um, so yeah, we're really delighted to be teamed up with the guys this afternoon. What's going to happen in a bit? Um, Professor Lutz is going to present um, on glucose sensing. Um, he's going to give you the theory behind it. And then we're going to do a quick um, transition over to um, Solren and Mots, who are in our conference room in, uh, in Norway. So I think at the moment, we're, we're basically web coming in from the UK, um, from the um, PalmSense headquarters and from the ZP headquarters. So it's a sort of, you know, three, three center um, webinar. So I won't say much more, but I am looking forward to this and um, I'll hand back to Lutz. So take it away, Lutz. Yeah, hi. So I'm Lutz Stratman. I'm um, with PalmSense. I'm an electrochemist at PalmSense. And um, yeah, today I'm going to present to you, um, well, the principles and theories of the experiment that we're going to do today. So the glucose measurement, and uh, I brought with me Adi today, um, my coworker, who is uh, your voice at the chat. So um, yeah, don't um, don't hesitate if you have questions, just to write into the chat, um, that we can answer your questions later during the Q and A session, which will be uh, after the experiment. Okay, cool. So let's just uh, dive right into the experiment. So today we want to detect glucose, and how are we going to do that? Well, what is the chemical reaction? We're going to take um, glucose and we're going to oxidate it. So we're using, um, in this case, oxygen <laughs> to oxidating it. And that is done with the enzyme glucose oxidase. Well, as chemists, biochemists, we're trying to be systematic and not rather creative with names. So glucose oxidase is an enzyme that oxidases glucose. It, glucose, uh, it oxidizes the glucose to gluconolactone, which is not very stable in water. Usually it uh, um, decays immediately to gluconic acid. Um, that makes it not great for detection. And it also doesn't have like a lot of electrochemical detections. And today, well, we want to do electrochemistry. Fortunately, uh, a byproduct of the, um, of the glucose oxidation is hydrogen peroxide. And the hydrogen peroxide can be, detect can be detected at an electrode easily and being um, reduced to oxygen. That oxygen can, in theory, again, react with glucose. So we would have to have a, a cycle. Um, this is now all a bit abstract. If you like it a bit more, well, I like it a bit more cartoon-like, that you can have a, bit of, a better visualization of the reaction. So here now you see in green the reduced forms of the different species, and in red, the oxidized form, you see how glucose is oxidized to gluconolactone, and uh, it does that with the enzyme gluconooxidase. Um, enzymes do have an active center, that is the place where the actual reaction is happening. And that active center is before the reaction um, in its oxidized state, and then it takes up an electron from the glucose, so the glucose gets 
oxidized because it loses an electron and the active center gets reduced because it takes up an electron. Right, but enzymes are catalysts. That means they make reactions easier, but in the end, they look the same as before. So now that active center needs to get rid of that electron and it likes to use uh, oxygen for that. So the oxygen is taking up the electron from the active center and is turning into hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so I've not done like the complete proper uh, stoichiometric reaction. This is just to give you uh, an idea what's going to happen, right? And the um, hydrogen peroxide is then again oxidized at the electrode. Okay, so this is what's going to happen. And uh, um, we're going to do that at an electrode. And now you think like, oh, that sounds rather complicated. We need a lot of stuff for that, right? Well, actually you don't need a lot of things to do an electrochemical detection. You need, well, your solution with your sample in it. Then you need uh, electrodes. So the interface between the liquid and, and the solid state, right? Usually a metal or maybe a carbon species. And in our case, because we want to detect the glucose with the glucose oxidase, our electrode needs to have glucose oxidase on it. Well, we're using a Zimmer and Peacock electrode for that, that already has um, glucose oxidase modified on it. And now this, um, now this electrode needs to have a potential applied to it so we can convert the hydrogen peroxide and measure the current that indicates that the reaction is happening. For that, we need a potentiostat and we need a software that controls that potentiostat and accordingly some kind of computer or in our case, a smartphone. And you see on the left side, the abstract concept and on the right side, the actual well, setup of the experiment. And the upper part, so the software and the potentiostat, this is what PalmSense does. Right, so you see the um, smartphone with our app PS Touch that you can use for doing your measurement. And you see the Sensit Smart, a very small potential stat to perform the measurement. The lower side that's, let's say, is closer to the reaction. So like um, what, how, what are the um, solutions that you use, how to make a proper electrode, have, an, have a protocol to run the measurement. This is all what uh, Zimmer and Peacock are very good at. So you immediately see why we're doing this together because we give the two parts that you need for your uh, electrochemical detection. Um, so just to give you a, um, a short idea of what is that little black box that we're using here, that is the Sensit Smart. So it's a very small potential stat based on the Amstead Pico, which is an OEM module. That means this is a small potential stat that you can build into your own devices if you want to build something yourself. In this case, we built it into our own device, which is the Sensit Smart. Um, so an end user device that does the usual electrochemical techniques like cyclic voltammetry, square wave voltammetry, chronon parametry, um, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. And it is compatible with um, PS Touch for Android. All right. Um, yes. So now I will just tell you what settings you can do. Well, that's a bit easier on the big screen. Or what settings we do for this experiment. That's a bit easier on this big screen. And then I will um, then I will transfer over to Solrun, and that she can show you the experiment. Okay. So for this experiment, we're using the technique chronoamperometry which just means we're applying a constant potential over time and measure the current. The current ranges that we select, which define like how sensitive is your potential stat um, or what resolution it has for, um, for the different currents, um, that we, we use the current ranges between one nanoampere up to 10 microamperes. And the advantage of most of our potential sets is that they have outer ranging. That means they will choose the right current range in the range that you have set for you. Um, then we have the equilibration time that is five seconds. That is just a short waiting time that the potential stat has before it really starts to record the values. This is because at the beginning of such experiments, we have often high capacitive charging currents and we don't want these. We want to see the electrochemistry and not the physics. We apply a constant potential of 650 millivolts. Um, there you can oxidize the hydrogen peroxide site nicely again. Then we have an interval time of half a second. That means every half a second, we will record a value. 
And then we have a running time of 600 seconds. That can be longer as well. That's no problem. Usually what uh, people do for these type of measurements, they set a time where they definitely know their experiment will be over. And then when they have all the values earlier than they expect, they just stop the measurement and save what they already have. Okay, this is all like what the, with the theory that we want to do today, uh, right now, that you're like feel ready for the experiment because we want to get into the, well, into the action. So um, I just uh, would like to uh, transfer now to Solren, who will show you this experiment. Hi, so my name is Solren, as Liz said. I'm a scientist here at Simon Peacock. And today I will demonstrate for you how uh, you can detect glucose in Coca-Cola. Um, so what we need is the sensor smart from PalmSets. And we will insert that into our smartphone and access the PS Touch app that you can get from the App Store. And uh, we will use the glucose uh, sensor kit from um, Simran Peacock. And here are some glucose sensors. We will insert that into our Sense It Smart. Like that. Um, and then we will go to method and we will put the same parameters that Lutz showed us. Um, so 0 0.65 volts, 600 seconds. Well, interval can be 0 0.5. Um, and that's good. Then we'll go to the plot and we will start with the Coca Cola Zero. So it's just worth saying that we're going to do we're going to do essentially two experiments. We're going to start with um, Coca Cola Zero, which is obviously the, in some in some countries the Diet Coke, no the sort of zero glucose version. And then Solren will explain that we'll go to um, Coke with all the good stuff in it, with all that sugar in it. Um, and we'll obviously have a look at the difference in the signal. So, um, so it's um, essentially, I mean, um, as Solron sets this up, it's um, it's a glucose sensor. It's plugged obviously into that um, sense. It smart. The sensor is, is going to apply the voltage. Um, as Solron places it into the Coca Cola Zero, then she'll start running the experiment. Now. And Solron can talk us through that. Tell me when you're ready, Solron. Yeah. So I just started the uh, experiment. So we will see a curve forming. And um, so what you see now is a typical chrono ampermetric curve. And uh, this is called the wedding wedding time. We're waiting for a baseline to form. Uh, and now it uh creates a um uh, electrical double layer and diffusion is happening so when we will reach equilibrium that's when we will have our baseline and that's when we will swap solutions um so as Lutz and martin said uh the sensor smart is a potential stat so we can use that for uh several um molecules like for instance uh, at simran peacock we have sensors for uh, potassium or sodium, nitrate, lactate, etc. Um, and it's only your imagination that limits uh, what uh, molecule that we can uh, detect with the potential stat like this. So I might, I, I might just add, see, so the, the sensor that we're testing at the moment is really what they call a CGM, a continuous glucose sort of monitoring sensor. So this is, as Luke said in his presentation, the enzyme is actually immobilized within a polymer. So with that kind of sensor, it takes a little while for the signal to essentially come down to a baseline. There's a there's another version of glucose sensing, which is SMBG, self-monitoring blood glucose. And those sensors, you know, you put a drop of blood on and you get results in five seconds. And that's because everything is soluble. It all dissolves up into the blood, you get this instantaneous reaction, but the downside is you can't reuse the sensor. So if you want to do continuous monitoring, then um, you want to do CGM. So we wait for the polymers to wet. 
and when it's reached um, a baseline, um, then we can then essentially transfer it across to the real coke, um, let's say, and have a look at the glucose um, signal then. So it's a bit like um, watching paint dry, the scientific version of watching paint dry. But Solron, tell us what you're seeing. Okay, now it's um, slowly forming a um, baseline. So you can here see the curve. And yeah, it's stabilizing. So we can try to swap solutions now. Are you tempted to swap now, or do you want to wait a few more seconds, or do you feel that? How, how many seconds has it been? Now it is 160, 160 seconds. So we'll and actually... Was... To... Yeah, go on, sorry, Soren, go ahead. No, we'll try to swap the solution now. Um, it is. It would get more stable with time, though, but I think this will be sufficient. So we will swap solutions like that. And now you see that the here is the baseline from the Coca-Cola Zero. And here you see a clear signal that we have sugar. Um, the occurrence has increased. Now that you can you can see that it's like flattening out. Um, and eventually it will start decreasing a little bit. And that's just because we don't have stirring. So there's a depletion of glucose at the electrode. But what you can oh, yeah. see here is a clear step um, from the glucose from Coca Cola Zero to uh, Coca Cola with glucose in it. Um, so and so that, 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 that little dip, I noticed you just as you did the swap over. I just noticed you just knocked the electrode, and that kind of broke the electrical connection. So it did that little drop out. But as you say, then it is now coming back to a nice little plateau. So cool. Yeah. And I think we should watch it for a bit because it's quite nice. Yeah. So we yeah. have the long, so we have that, as you say, as you described, we have that lot, we have that settling time. Then we have the little dip where we were transferring from one beaker to the other beaker. And then it comes back up. And if you look at the, if you look now, it's coming to a, it's rather than falling now, it's got, it's essentially at a, at a plateau. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, it's essentially showing a steady state current due to the glucose um, reaction with the enzyme. So what are your thoughts, Solren? Uh, well, I actually stopped the, the measurement right now. But yeah, you can clearly see the step um, as the uh, electrode or the sensor is uh, detecting glucose. And as you said, it's slowly starting to go down due to the lack of stirring. But um, I would say that this is a very successful uh, attempt at detecting glucose in the Coca-Cola. So I think um, it's, it's, you know, so I appreciate um, the nice introduction from Lutz. So we got the nice theory from Lutz. And then um, essentially we, we did, we presented then the demonstration of that theory um, in that um, sense it's smart potential stats along with our glucose sensor. So I think the next intention was to, you know, maybe um, ask questions. Um, so we've, th there's a bit of a chat um, window up, but uh, Ardi, you also had the idea of um, putting a few polls out there. So do you want to just tell us about the polls that you had, that you, you were thinking about? Yeah, sure. Um, so the idea is that we, uh, everyone can write a question below here. And actually I got some questions in the, in the private chat window, so I'll ask that to you go both as well. Um, but please guys, if you have any questions, just drop them in the chat. Um, yeah, let's start with the first question. Uh, this one is for you, actually, Martin. Um, yeah, actually, you showed something with glucose, of course. It's nice that it works, but uh, what if you want to do any other analyze? Uh, what is possible? Could you explain a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, what's what's possible is this. I mean, the, the small the smallest analytes around are probably ions. So if you want to do well, the smallest uh, the smallest analyte is probably the proton. So with this um, sense, it's smart. You can do pH. So that's the smallest thing you can do. Then you come into small molecules like glucose. Um, so with those, you then need things like enzymes. So there's a glucose sensor out there. There's a lactate sensor out there. There's an alcohol sensor out there. 
there's now a cortisol sensor which is a, a hormone so we like with small with small molecules we like it if they have an enzyme um, and then you're starting to go a little bit bigger so proteins so um everyone's very interested in really immunosensors um, and immunosensors are sort of the next level in difficulty but we can do um proteins and i say we i mean you and mm. um, people out there um and then the next level after the proteins is then maybe the viruses so you know we've done some work in the last year and it's on the it, it's in hospitals now for covid 19 detection and then the next level up after that then is bacteria um and you know so we can do bacteria and i think probably the largest thing that we are detecting at the moment um is sperm so we're so we're, we're, we're measuring male fertility so i just give you a range from the proton up to um spermazoa yeah thank you um we also have a question for lutz um lutz you and so in the university showed a very small potential there, right the, the sense is smart but what instrument would you recommend and how do i know if this sensor spot will be good enough for my sensor right okay um that is a bit of a difficult question um because there's there's so many different types of experiments out there and especially when you want to commercialize them there are even more questions popping up so in general i would say when you start with researching your technology um you should have a rough idea what kind of potentials and currents you're looking at, right? And then you will have diff different potential stats. I mean, that depends on your research. I guess because of the title of the seminar, nobody from like um, car batteries or giant fuel cells is, is here. And they, um, and they don't, uh, um, they have very large ampères, so they will look for very different devices than what we offer. So we offer usually small devices, and these small devices have lower currents, lower potentials than these super big ones. But even in, these, in this range of potential stats, there is a difference. Um, for example, um, we have the uh, PoundSense 4, which can go up to 30 milliampere, while a potential stat of the size of the Sensit Smart can go up to 3 milliampere. So this is one criteria. How much current do you expect? Then um, how, um, how much resolution would you require? Like how low do you go in current? And then you would look at that parameter as well. Then what potentials you need to apply, et cetera. Which technique do you require? So you, we have, of course, every producer has this, and we have that on our website documents where you can look at the different specifications. And usually you first look like, okay, um, I think I think if I would say like the the, the main things are um, the current that I expect, the potential that I need to apply or expect, and then the technique, and that will be like the four main rough criteria you look for a potential, and then you go to other things. Um, let's say for all these type of portable. Um, applications. We do have a lot of portable potential stats, but when you want to go into larger scaling, you usually want to build your own device, you know, that has your own brand, your own shape, right? We all want to have, well, because we've talked about Coca-Cola in that seminar, we all want to have a product that is as iconic as a Coca-Cola bottle, right? You see the shape and you know which company it is you have. And, you have an association with it. So you want to have these OEM products where you buy just that the, the PCB, like, like the Amstead Pico module, and you build your own device around it. So usually when you want to go into that commercial direction, I would advise that you look like which ones of these is more suitable for you. Um, so in most cases, it's a bit of an individual process, but you can usually already narrow it down. And the advantage, like when you work with a company like PoundSense is you can start with research potential stats and often um, you can use a research potential set that also has an OEM version. So you don't have that strong gap in your transition process from and you, from research to OEM. So when you do your research, you do it with the same potential set that you then later use for serial production. Um, I hope that gives the person an Lutz, idea. Let's let me ask you a quick question. Yes. What's, what's, your, what's the top? What's the top of the range single channel EIS instrument that you have? For us, that is the PoundSense Four, which is also the the biggest one. Um, right now, so then. But my, the answer to the question is, it's the Palm Sense 4 that you want. 
because that will that will give you EIS and all the DC techniques and probably has a fairly good current um, low current range. I know who's asked the question, so I'm gonna answer the question. Is the palm sense for? Okay. Yeah, it is like mostly, but I know who were asking the question, so the answer is palm sense four. Okay, because the palm sense four is also like for us, that's the most versatile one. So that's like when people are in doubt, which potential set, we usually recommend the Palm Sense 4 um, because it is, yeah, it is like it has the highest specifications of our instruments and it will most likely cover everything. If somebody wants to go into a serial pro uh, production of their own detection system, like a um, system similar to your chili pot, for example, if, if you want to make or a COVID detection, you want to rather have something like the Amstead Pico. Uh, but then you have to check for your specifications because the smaller your potential state, also the narrower the capabilities, you could say. So then you want you want to check it and you want to look at the core specifications. All right. Thank you. Um, and we actually have two more questions from Martin. Uh, Martin, um, we just saw this experiment with the Simran Pico biosensor. Uh, how many measurements can we do with this one? I can answer the question in a slightly different way. We're on, we have now been running um, one of these glucose sensors in one of our projects for over three months. So that's a slightly different answer, but we've had this set, we've had one of these glucose sensors in continuous operation for over three months. Now your question is, is how many times can I reuse it? So, so and I'll answer the question by, depends how much care you take over it, but in continuous operation, these sensors have, in our hands, and we are pretty expert, have, have been used for over three months. I suspect that we'll be able to take these glucose sensors to um, 12 months quite easily. And the reason that we're doing this is we're, we've got a program for measuring the health of fish. You know, fish are our cousins, we've got to take care of these fish. You know, so we've, um, so we're, we've got a project which is the continuous monitoring of fish and the health of fish. And in that project, so far, we've been continually running the glucose sensor for over three months. Um, so that in part answers your question. Now, if you put blood and urine and all sorts of yuck over it, then you, you know, you've got to basically decontaminate it and then reuse it. So that's, so the answer to your question is they're pretty robust, but in the end, they're as robust as how robust they are depends on how well you treat them. All right. Thank you. And, um, we also saw that the experiment, it, it takes a few minutes. What if we would make this experiment a bit faster? What would you need to change? If we were going to try and change it, so if, if your application is put a drop of blood on there and get a fast reading, then rather than having the enzymes all bound up in a polymer, so we've put them in a polymer so they essentially don't dissolve away, that they're locked in place. Rather than doing that, we would make what's called a soluble formulation so the enzyme quickly, the blood came in, the enzyme dissolved, the reaction started immediately, and we could do a fast result. So that's that's how we would... Um, speed it up, either make the reagent soluble or very much thin down the polymer that we were actually using. All right, that makes sense. Um, another question, and I think this is best for Solwin. Um, so when you did your uh, uh, experiment, and how exactly do you now know the concentration of the glucose? And what is actually the accuracy if you compare it to other analytical methods? So I think if Solron's not there, I'll quickly answer the oh, question. That, yeah, sure. um, so essentially, now what, what comes off that potential stat um, is a current. So what you do, what you have to do is you have to have calibrated the batch of sensors to say, I have a, I have a sensitivity factor that says this current equals this much glucose. So what, what the sense it smart does is it gives you the raw signal. Now, um, Lutz touched upon the fact that they do an OEM product. So you really then have to do the next piece of engineering, which is take the raw signal, put it through your calibration factor, which is based on um, your factory calibration of the electrodes and turn current back into glucose concentration. So there's a step that we didn't show you today, which is, but we've shown you um, how to get the raw, raw current. Your next step then is to apply a calibration factor to turn current back into concentration. And that's how you would get the um, glucose reading. I just want to say, I mean, there, there's no um, electrochemistry. Um, the accuracy of a commercial glucose strip, and these are you know accepted in hospitals, accepted across the world. 
at about 90 milligrams per deciliter or five millimolar, those glucose strips are only plus or minus 15% accurate. So it's quite you know, inaccurate, but it's good enough for the application. So the accuracy you require depends on the application that you're dealing with. I have actually a question for Martin. <laughs> So I have a question for Martin. So I, because because I was listening to your to your fish project, and I was wondering, there's there's a big problem usually in so long continuous measurings, and that's like biofouling. Did you uh, uh, did you somehow take care of it, or is the fish tank just so clean that you don't have like something growing on, on the biosensor? It's a good question. So um, biofoul biofouling the the further you go into the body, the less problems you have with biofouling. Because biofouling and foreign body response, which you're describing, is, you know, if you're making a interstitial glucose sensor that goes through the skin, then this, this zone of your body is very good at foreign body rejection because that's where you get all splinters and cuts and that's where your immune system. If you put the same glucose sensor much deeper into the body, it doesn't actually get fouled at, at, at anywhere near the same rate because your immune system is actually uh, most responsive at the sort of peripherals of your body and the deeper you go in. So in fact, where you place the sensor, if you go in quite deep, then you actually get away from the get away from some of the biofouling problems. And the quick answer is no, we don't have a magic bullet where biofouling just gone away now. And but that is the biggest problem in continuous glucose monitoring in human beings is biofouling. Um, we can partly overcome it because we can go quite deep in the fish. Uh, whereas with a real real human body, you don't want to be that invasive. Um, just to overcome biofouling. So the quick answer is no, no silver bullet for, from us. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I do want to launch the poll, uh, and there is one more question. Uh, so let's first launch the poll. This is about uh, what would you like to see in the next webinar. So of course there are several things we can uh, uh, show you. For sure we will have another webinar together with uh, Zimmer and Peacock, and we would like to know what you guys would be interested in. Um, and meanwhile, while you can, while you guys choose your uh, your answer, uh, we're going to one more question. Um, yeah, this is about could you actually repeat the whole measurement? Well, I have good news for all of you. Uh, we're going to send you all uh, an email with a link to the recording, so you can actually repeat it uh, as many times as you would like to just uh, see what you uh, what you were looking for. All right, and I see that meanwhile we get lots of responses. To what will be the next webinar? I see that number one is currently to measure pH and to measure actually caffeine. Yes, of course. All right. I see all these people buying them, and then they are measuring if uh, the colleagues in the office have uh, replaced the coffee with decaffeinated coffee, or replaced the decaffeinated with caffeinated coffee. To just create a bit of drama in the office. <laughs> I think it says something about the technique of electrochemistry that you can actually deal with. You know, you can you can test coke. You know, coke's a fairly clean sample. You can test blood. You can test white wine. You can test red wine. You can test orange juice. You can test coffee. Most and most a lot of analytical techniques like fluorescence or absorption spectroscopy. You know, they demand that the sample is kind of transparent. Whereas electrochemistry, you can test things from blood to chili sauce. And that's really why I think if you want to make a low cost, real world sample test, then I think electrochemistry is the guy. If you want to make a, a, a laboratory test that sits in a big centralized hospital with lots of air conditioning and lots of control of the conditions, you can need electrochemistry. You could use all sorts of techniques like surface plasma resonance. But if you want to make quick and dirty tests at a low cost, then I would recommend electrochemistry. All right, well, we're done with all the questions. We've answered all of them, and I hope in a, in a sufficient and pleasant way. Uh, we also see clearly that to measure caffeine is the most popular one, so we will think about how we can organize a webinar around that. And for sure, we will invite you for that one as well. And for now, I'd like to thank everyone for joining, and I uh, hope you've uh, enjoyed this webinar. All right, see you guys. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thanks, Ardy. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone, for Bye -bye. watching. <laughs>